In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on the community, arts, culture, and more. And today I'm very pleased to be joined by Elliot Perry to talk about the critical needs of youths in Memphis, particularly after this year of COVID. Elliot, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing well. This um, came about in no small part because we um, ran into each other in Crosstown, um, uh, where the radio station WYXR is based, where I live, and where you you have an office with the Poplar Foundation. And you brought up just, and this was probably a month ago, six weeks ago, um, how concerned you are about young people. And you've been working with young people and advocating for mentor, mentorship and, and through the Poplar Foundation and what uh, chair of the board of the Grizzlies Foundation. I mean, you've been living and working with youth uh, in a serious way for a long time. But the pandemic created a whole new level of challenges, I've got to believe. And so tell me why, when, and we, why, how that came up and why, what is your concern right now? And we'll, we'll dive into that and what can be done. Yeah. So I was, you know, obviously, you know, mentoring is, is, is obviously close to my heart. I mean, it's, it's a part of just kind of my journey and how, um, you know, somebody poured into my life and, and, and helped me really reach my full potential or at least see my full potential uh, at, at some point and, and, and really just stay with me to encourage me. And, and, and that's what I see could be a game changer for our community. It's not just about grades. It's about grades, gifts and, and having those other voices really to pour into you to let you know that, you know, a part of your journey is, you know, there's going to be some ebbs and flows in your journey. And so throughout this process, you know, obviously I've been working with the Grizzlies Foundation and and that came about, um, obviously the Grizzlies are here, NBA team, but we wanted to do something that was a little bit different, that was more tangible than just, you know, NBA mandated, read to achieve, you know, some of those things and all of those things are great. But we wanted to do something that could be more tangible in terms of, of connecting people with people. And so we, we landed on mentoring because we thought, hey, this is not a black situation. It's not a white situation. It's more of a people situation. And the more people we can get to volunteer and pour into our young people, we think the better off our community could be. So, long, so that's a long way of saying when I talk with you throughout this pandemic, through the Grizzlies Foundation, we, we do a few things. We partner with other foundations like a Big Brothers, Big Sisters or... Uh, like a GIF, or, um, you know, in a number of other foundations, I mean, sure. a number of other organizations. But we also have what we call uh, a in-house team mentoring organ, uh, 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 part of our uh, mentoring. And, and that team mentoring, Eric, is we pair three adults with six kids and we meet once a week. And we have five schools that we partner with, five charter schools that we partner with, well, and district schools that we partner with. Uh, and throughout this process, we've been doing it virtually. Usually we're after school inside of a classroom, sure. you know, sitting with these kids and we've been doing it virtual. And I just noticed that, you know, my young men were, they were there, but they were not all there. Yeah, you right. Know? Um, um, we have six kids, three of them show up consistently. The yeah. other three, they would pop in, in and out. And then I had one young man who just completely, which is the young man who I thought was, I would put anything on him and he just completely yeah. Yeah. Bailed, bailed out on me. And I talked to his mom last week, but I, you know, I realized that our kids were dealing with so many other things and right. this pandemic really highlighted all of the other stuff that they were dealing with, you know, being at yeah. home, being online, you know, just, and, 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 and so, yeah, I was concerned that when this pandemic is over, not only do we need the volunteers who have been volunteers volunteering to be mentors. We need more volunteers to pour into our young people. We need more volunteers to let them know that, hey, you know, it's going to be okay. And, um, 
you know, yeah. and, and really just fight to help them, you know, realize that, you know, whatever you're going through, it's okay because you, you know, you're not the first one to go through it. Right. And again, I mean, this is Eric Barnes of the Daily Memphian talking with uh, Elliot Perry. I mean, you know, we're all sick of Zoom. Right. I mean, we, you know, you and I are doing this by Zoom because it was convenient and we haven't fully opened the studio up yet and just so on. But I'm just sick of it. Right. And and I had an experience, you know, over the last year, I get asked, you know, nice enough to get asked to speak to various groups. And and one was a college, a group of grad students at a at a, a very good university. And and I've done that kind of stuff before. And and this isn't a university where you know you can't stereotype, but there's 30 kids on there, 30 young people who probably by and large have pretty um, access to means and support to be at this school. And it was a little bit shocking when we got on the Zoom and I saw their faces. And this was probably in 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 February. And I've done this stuff forever, you know, not probably not as much as you, but I've all these speaking engagements, all this stuff. And it was kind of shocking to see how not disinterested but almost a little bit, I, I hate to use this word, but it's, it was numb. Mm-hmm. They were just not engaged. They were, and, and I'm not, maybe, you know, maybe some of them didn't want to hear what I had to say, but I, I'm making a joke. It was obvious. Right. It, I mean, these kids are basically the, the age of my 20 year old college kids. And I saw it with my college kids, you know, one who graduated and one who's a junior, the, the, the wearing down of this zoom and this disconnection and this lack of, true interpersonal, you know, connection among everyone. So if you're talking about kids who are mentoring and kids maybe who, who are more at risk, I just can't imagine um, uh, how difficult it was. And I guess also difficult for the volunteer. Absolutely. Right? Because everyone had a rough year. So, and, and, I mean, you know, not to cut you off. And I think well, that you, bring, you, you brought up a good point is, is this, this idea of disconnecting. You know, and, and, and what my hope is, is that what, what I'm advocating for with volunteers in our community uh, uh, through the Grizzlies Foundation and other organizations is that reconnecting, that reimagining, you know, how do we reconnect with our young people? And, and not just for their sake, but for, but for our sake, too. You know, how, how, how do we begin to, to, to repair those relationships? How do we begin to begin to encourage our young people? How do we begin to to think of new and different ideas and in, in different ways of re-engaging right. with our young people? So that could be a combination of things. You know, I think Zoom brought something into effect that, um, you know, it could be both. You know, yeah. we, we, not right. only can we meet, you know, in person, Nowadays, I mean, we still can do a lot of Zoom calls, and, and and I commend the Grizzlies Foundation for not just really letting the rope go. I mean, we could have easily let the rope go and said, "Hey, it's going to be too hard. You know, let's let make this year a wash, and then do you know just reconvene next year." And yeah. doing this through Zoom, I think at least it gave us an opportunity to at least hold on to our young people, you know, for whatever time we had them, um, sure. and, and try to make that difference through Zoom. Um, let me turn around and, you know, sort of contradict myself. I, I, I had a, a interviewed Sally uh, Jones Hines from the, from MIFA. And she talked about how, you know, the difficulties they were having through the pandemic and the work they do with seniors. She said one sort of thing they learned that they will continue post pandemic is because they couldn't do face to face with seniors. They did a lot more phone calling and they found that they're that, that actually that was just this really great way to connect with homebound seniors and that they that that a lot of them are homebound despite it doesn't have anything to do with COVID. And so that they will continue was her plan, as she told me, to to do more phone contact, yeah. touching base with people. Do you think that mentoring programs will, again, contradicting what I said, not be fully Zoom based, but more ways of connecting people? Because there is an efficiency to Zoom and there's an efficiency to this kind of level of connection. Yeah, you know, I think you need I think you need it at all levels. I think, you, again, I think you need to be really creative and really open about how do we engage with our young people? Young people have their phones every day, all day. They're on them every day, all day. How do we use that to our advantage? You know, obviously, person to person is always the best because obviously you can look into their eyes. You could talk to, to them. But we also do group texting, too. And so our our group is we, we can send out a text and everybody can respond back and forth, back and forth. And so, you know, do we use text? Do we use, you know, FaceTime at times? Do we use Zoom, Zoom at times? And, and, and so I think if we can use all these different platforms to reach our young people and 
also it also is is a way to make it easier for the volunteer to you know most volunteers think about i don't have anything to offer or i don't have the time and what i'm asking our volunteers to do is to think about if somebody said they didn't have the time for you you know think about we, we, we've all had mentors and it, it doesn't matter how how you slice it up whether it was a teacher whether it was a you know a pastor whether it was a, a you know a person who called themselves a mentor a coach or whatever but think about the people who have poured into your life and if they thought mm, you know i just don't have the time or i don't have anything to offer all of us have experiences and so how do we be vulnerable with our young people and share those experiences with our young people to let them know that you know your journey is nothing you have to run from. It's something you should embrace. You know, yeah. I've, I've, I've had challenges in my life. I've been 14 years old and, you know, had, had the ups and downs in my life, you know, didn't have the confidence in myself. Uh, and so don't look at what you think is a finished product, you know, quit, quit trying to compare yourself to a finished product and, and, and really embrace the journey. And I can share so many stories with you about throughout these last six years that I've been mentoring at Grizzlies Prep all the young men that I come in contact with and interface with being their mentor, they bring such a tremendous amount of equity to the table. Um, and, 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 and so much grit and grind, they, they already have it in them. You know, how do we redirect that energy and say, like, right. this is what, you know, you have, this is what you should be doing. And, and, and a lot of times, Eric, last thing is I'm there to ask questions. And, and many of the times when I ask those questions, they answer their own questions because they realize what they have. They realize what they want to do. They realize some of their own dreams and what they want to do. Now, how do we nudge them to be able to go out and accomplish some of those things? Um, it, it, the, uh, you mentioned Grizzlies Prep, the charter school. Um, in normal times, um, over the years, I've done, um, kid, coincidentally, um, uh, uh, they, they ran a student newspaper for a few years. They may mm-hmm. still, I'm not sure, but they would bring this, the class over and they'd bring them over to, this was the old daily news before we launched daily Memphian. And it was always really fun for me to, to have these. And I think they would bring them in two groups. It was like right. the fourth and fifth graders and then the sixth and seventh or something like that. One, the difference between those ages is hysterical. It's just so funny that just a couple of years, but they are great kids. So interested in, and, you know, they were, I think it was an elective to be in the, the newspaper. And you do have this little moment. I've never been a, a formal mentor to people, but, you know, I got 20 kids in my office and I'm talking about how we make a newspaper and how I got into that. And then I'd sort of say, well, does anybody have any questions? And 18 to 20 kids would put their hand up. And, and, and the questions were everything from, do you run comics to how much money do you make? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, yeah. But all that kind of, we, that you, you realize all these things that, that, um, these, the, the, if they've never met somebody who's been part of a newspaper, so they got a million and one questions and they're kids. And so every, like something you said, reminded me of that. It wasn't just the grocery prep thing, but there is every one of those kids could be, could go into journalism, right? Absolutely. The, everything's possible to them. And to be in that environment where they would, they would wear in a good way, wear me out with questions. I mean, well, how, how, how does this type form? And you know, how does the, where does the paper come from? And they just, this endless curiosity, um, and I didn't do anything special. I just answered, you know, these things that I know because I've been in, in journalism and news for so long. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a second about, I'm going to do a quick break here, but talk a little bit more how people can get involved. But first, uh, this is Eric Barnes uh, from the Daily Memphian. I'm talking to Elliot Perry today on the sidebar. It airs on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. Focus on the community, on arts, culture, and people in Memphis. Um, it is not just a radio show, though. It's one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, as well as Bill Dree's politics podcast, a number of sports podcasts, and Jennifer Biggs' food podcast, Sound Bites, which also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at 11. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, as well as iTunes, Spotify. You can find them on Google or wherever you get your podcasts. And now a quick message from our sponsor. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. 
I am back with uh, Elliot Perry here. How, how can, like, I, there's some stats on the Grizzly Foundation site that are sort of profound. You know, 50, kids who have a mentor, 55% are more likely to enroll in college, 81% are more likely to participate in an extracurricular at school or out of school, uh, 55% are less likely to skip a day of school. So for people who want to get involved in mentoring, w- what do they do? Just go to grizzliesfoundation.org. I mean, it's that simple, you know. Uh, tap the mentoring uh, tab and, 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 and it'll redirect you, but you'll see all of the organizations that we partner with. And I think the good thing about being a hub, so to speak, with the Mentor Grizzlies Foundation is, you know, any level of mentoring you want to do, whether you want to do one-on-one mentoring, whether you want to do team mentoring, whether you want to do, uh, you know, you want to work with juveniles, we work with GIF, whether you want to work with troubled kids, uh, whether you want to work with uh, you know, high achieving kids. I mean, so all, all of those things exist by us being a hub and having all of those affiliates uh, in our organization. And so uh, I, I think it's just that easy. You know, you, you think about uh, when, when you're talking about your experience with the, with the, with the newspaper. And, and that's one of the things we, we, we've talked about probably in the last uh, month since they've had a new leader, Tim Ware's the new leader at Grizzlies Prep uh, is <clears throat> more exposure for our young people. I think that sometimes is what our young people lack is having that exposure uh, and also having the access, you know, how do you, how do you build, how do you build a network? How do you, how do you communicate with people? How do you, some of those soft skill things, but the exposure and the access is, is everything because I think it, 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 it breeds a new level of, you know, here's a new group of people that we haven't even thought about, you know, as these kids matriculate through middle school, go to high school, and then go to college. After they get to and through college as first generation graduates, then what's next? You know, how do we get jobs? How do we, how do we have, have we built a Rolodex for ourselves? And so all of those things we need to talk about, but the earlier you can expose them, uh, I think they're better. Yeah. It, it, one thing, you know, that, and we've done, we've written about it at Daily Memphian on Behind the Headlines and did a series of shows about the schools. And, and, and this is not a judgment of SCS staying um, uh, virtual for so long. I mean, that's a whole conversation, but the, but the fact is they did, right? Um, and, you know, the numbers, at least nationally, are really haunting in terms of the number of kids who, who really kind of just sort of like, it was a little bit of the dynamic you described with the, the kids you work with, with, with Zoom mentoring. Some of them, you know, they weren't as connected or many of them, you know, some of them just weren't attending. And there were there have been stats of as much as a twenty five to thirty percent of kids just not even checking in on their devices, oh, yeah. and so on nationally, and it's a little unclear what the lo- the local numbers are, but they're very high. Um, and and I talked even to a head of a charter school, a network of charter schools who who had done it was one of the earlier ones to come back to in person and then go hybrid and then back to in person and you know sort of bounce through all that. And she was really blunt, and it was very haunting because she said, you know, look. I mean, we're open, but, and we're hybrid and we're connecting with kids, but it's not going well. I mean, the kids who were doing well before all this, yeah, they're probably doing okay during it, but the kids who weren't doing well before this are just doing worse. Right. And so, I mean, I, I just, I've just got to believe, and I got to turn this into a question, but it's more of a statement that, that this year of, of remote learning has got to have been so hard on kids. Forget the academics even for a second, just the connection to peers, the inability to be in, whether it's theater or band or sports, um, the, you know, for many of these kids, the whole food a- aspect that they right, will rely. Yeah. I mean, it's just gonna have profound long-term impacts, not just, you know, we get too focused on the test scores, right? And the, 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 they're, we're up 3% or down 3%. I'm not saying that's not important. It is important for kids to read, write, and, and learn. But we don't really have a test score for disaffection and for tuning out. And, and I've got to believe that it's just going to take a long time to recover for these kids who've been totally removed, right, from, from normalcy, the normalcy they attach to school. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think – from an academic perspective, you know, obviously kids are are behind and, and, and that may take some time to catch kids up because, you know, you have a lot of kids that were already two years behind. Now you have a year, a year and a half, close to two years of not being in, in the classroom. But 
you know, when, when I think about the mentoring aspect of it is, you know, this is about resilience and, 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 and having the bounce backness in you to have to being tough, uh, to going through the process, to embracing a lot of the process. And that's, that's what I talk about with a lot of my young men is everything you need. God has given it to you. You have all the ingredients. Now, you have to take some time to put all the ingredients together and then allow the cake to bake. You, you know, once you put the ingredients together, you still have to allow that that time for the cake to bake and then sit it out and allow for it to cool before you cut into it. And so thinking about it from that perspective, um, you know, gives me this idea that it's not just all academics. It's, it's can we get our young people to embrace their own gifts? You know, and, 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 and I mentioned before, this is one of the, the, the and I tell this story uh, because it, it's always relevant. And I, and I tell it uh, because it's a personal story of mine. And I talk about the, the, when my uncle taught me how to swim, Eric. And back in the day, I, we used to go to Gooch Swimming Pool in North Memphis. And back in the day, they just used to throw you in the swimming pool and you floundered around a little bit, you know. But finally, I learned how to swim. And I would only swim in the three and the five feet. And one day we were going to the swimming pool. My uncle said, you're going off the diving board today. And I said, no, I'm not going to be able to do that. I mean, man, I can't, you know, that's just. And so anyway, he convinced me to go off the diving board. And when you get in line at a public swimming pool, there's only one board. So there's a line that's behind you. And my uncle got directly behind me. And one person went off the diving board. He took his index finger and he just kind of nudged me in my back. He didn't force me. He just kind of tapped my back and I took a step forward. And he did that until my time came. And my time came, I got on the diving board, very reluctantly, I jumped off, you know, swam to the top, maybe swam over to the bank and, 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 and got out of the water. And the very first thing I did when I got out of the water was I went back and got in line. Yeah. You see, what, what, what I tell my young people is, is that my uncle didn't do anything special. Whatever I accomplished was already in me. All he did was just nudge me out of my comfort zone. He nudged me to swim in deeper waters. And that's all we're asking volunteers to do is to, you don't have to, the kid doesn't have to be you. We just ask you to nudge them out of their comfort zones, ask them difficult questions and, and, and find ways to engage with them so that they see their own potential. Yeah. Uh, this is Eric Barnes with the Daily Memphian and you're listening to the sidebar. I'm uh, talking today to Elliot Perry. Um, I think about that kind of story a lot lately uh, for brighter reasons, things going on in my family. So bear with me. And I grew up with my brother was two years older than me. And we have a cousin uh, who's about two years older than my brother. Yeah. And he was like a brother to us. And and I look back, you know, I grew up in this big blue collar city and we were, did not have much money at all. And um, I, I, I am fascinated by why my cousin um, ended up um, going to jail doing drugs mm -hmm. really, you know, he left school. And I think that was probably a key thing in his junior, you know, junior high school, he left and never really went back, but we were, he's brilliant. He's, he's still a brilliant guy. He's a charismatic guy. Um, he is, he is so much, he's fun to be with. Um, but he went down a really bad path and you just, you just see like, there's three of us and there are pictures of us of families. There's three of us, you know, right. these little guys, why he went that way. And what a difference, I think, for him, it was school and just a, he couldn't connect. He couldn't find a place. All that charismatic, you know, um, witty, just he was just a, he still is sort of a joy that this guy had. And it just went it, went, it had nowhere to go. And it, it didn't he didn't. And I look at myself and other people I was around, you know, it was all about for me, it was teachers. It was right. just a couple of teachers here, there, my mother, and then a couple of teachers that just kind of kept guardrails up and I bounced off, you know, some stuff I'm not proud of, but it, yep. that's why I live. I always tell people that's why I live 2000 miles from home. Um, the, those little differences, there was no profound moment for me, you know, and I don't know that there was a profound moment for my cousin. It was just, he didn't have the guardrails. He, he, he bounced too hard and he, he went off and, and, and it's a real tragedy. You know, and now he's almost a 60 year old man, you know, 50 something year old man. And anyway, so it just I, I, maybe because I'm getting old and I just am thinking about those kinds of things a lot that these little differences that people can make in terms of 
bouncing back on path. Cause we all make mistakes, right? right? It's just all about bouncing back onto a better path. Um, so again, people can get involved with mentoring through Grizzlies Foundation. Um, that's the best place to yeah. go. You big list of different types of organizations that y'all work with. Um, I was going to switch gears. Anything else on that? We have just a couple minutes left, and I was going to switch gears on you a little bit. Well, I, I'll say this to end, just picking back off, picking back off of what you were talking about with with, with your cousin is is <clears> that there's a fine line between you know going in the right direction, going in the wrong direction. And sometimes you can go in the wrong direction and then in that in in that process find your way to the find your way in the right direction. It, it, it is that right. you know idea of you know the, the struggle you know forced me to think outside of the box and then I found my way throughout that struggle. Uh, yeah. then there's then there's the peer power. I mean the, the you know the peer pressure, I'm sorry, where where where, where your peers can take you in the right direction or take you in the wrong direction. You know, are you in tune with who are your friends with, you know, all of those things. And then there's just this general idea that life is going to slap you around too. I mean, that's just a part of it. But what, what, what we're trying to do is to say that to, to our young people is that, okay, you already know that now. I, I'm telling you that life is going to slap you around, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and my grandfather used to say it in this way. You know, he, he used to say some things that I, I didn't understand. And, you know, when I didn't understand him, he, he wouldn't give me the answer, but he would say, you know, just keep living. And so in, in other words, he was saying, you, you will come and you, it'll, you will face it at some point. But I'm, I'm telling you now that you're going to face it. And when you do face it, do you have the resilience? Yeah. Do you have the the, the, the wherewithal uh, to be able to withstand it and, and, and still accomplish some of the things you want to accomplish. Yeah. Um, with just a couple of minutes left, I, I'm curious, I mean, you, you are known for this work for people who know you do this work. You're obviously known for, for being a Memphis Tiger, for your attachment to the Grizzlies, for, you know, basketball player, you're an art collector. If, if you're stuck in an elevator with somebody for, you know, long enough that you strike up a conversation, how, how do you, what do you, how do you describe yourself? Um, you know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, probably, um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I had this quote I was trying to find that I think would, would, uh, describe me. And, uh, and, and this came from like a, a, a King, a, a Dr. King, um, speech. Um, and it, it said that, that that there's something within all of us that causes us to cry out with Gotha. There's enough stuff in me to make both a gentleman and a scholar. You know, so I think that there is a you know enough stuff in me to make me both a gentleman and, and I mean a gentleman and a rogue. I'm sorry. Uh, and then there's enough stuff within all of us to cry out with the Apostle Paul. I see and approve the better things in life, but the evil things I do. And so I'm both. You know, I can be a gentleman or I can, I can be a rogue. It just depends on the decisions and the choice you make. And so my, my thought is, is that what my mentor taught me years ago is the most valuable thing he ever taught me in, in, in my life. And I carry that to this day is when I was struggling at 14, 15, and, and also at the same time becoming a really, really good basketball player at the same time, too, but right. still struggling, you know. Uh, not sure and not having the confidence in myself that I can accomplish these things. You know, the things that you're telling me I can accomplish coming from North Memphis, how, you know? Yeah. And one day he just got fed up. He took me to a mirror and he said, you see that little boy looking back at you? Everything you need to know in life, he's going to be the first one to tell you. He's going to be the first one to tell you when to quit. That little boy is going to be the first one to tell you, man, you know, let's keep digging. Let's keep grinding. Uh, you know, let's keep fighting. And, and, and so I carry that with me uh, because, you know, I, I don't see myself as this great basketball player, you know, great art collector, great scholar, great. I'm just me. And, yeah. and, 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 and there's nothing interesting, exciting or better than anyone else about me that that I have in me that that's, you know, where it, it somebody else can't be, the, you know, be the same. And so. You know, every man is my superior. You know, I can learn from anybody. Yeah. 
Um, last question before I go. I've asked pretty much everybody I've done the show with the first concert you ever went to. First concert I ever went to was a uh, was a was a was a Prince concert at the uh, at the Mid South Coliseum. I was oh. in high school, and I I was in the high school, and my mentor took me, and I was with. <laughs> I was, with, I was with I was with I was with my mentor. <laughs> I was with my mentor, Derek Phillips, uh, Derek Burroughs, uh, who's playing football. Uh, Dorian Major, uh, God rest his soul. He's passed now, but uh, he, he was a Memphis State football player. So I was with those three. Derek Phillips was a basketball player at Memphis wow. State, and then Derek Burroughs and uh, and Dorian Major and, and my mentor. So I was a That's you know, pretty young, I think an eighth grader or something like that. Hanging out with those guys. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was That's cool. good. That's a good one. That's a good one. Well, Elliot Perry, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll do it again sometime. Um, thank you. And thank you for listening. A reminder, the sidebar airs on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. You can get the full podcast of the show on the Daily Memphian site, WYXR, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. And we'll see you next week. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.